Hi there, thanks for joining me. I'm Matt Reed, a digital media and website design expert. And I'm here today to give you guys a quick webinar, about 20 minutes or so, to give you a quick rundown on how you can better promote your business um, and improve it online using the web. Now obviously if you have a website already or you don't have a website, then this is still for you. Um, you'll find hopefully one or two good bits of information here that you can implement into your, biz, uh, your business and your website straight away um, and start seeing results. Even one thing can make a change. Now, now obviously the more you get the better, so uh, let's get started with it. So let's have a brief intro guys, who I am. I'm Matt Reed. I'm from New Zealand and I have uh, I set up my web, web design business back in 2007, about 11 years ago now. Since then I've helped over 600 Kiwi businesses um, and a couple of international businesses get online in way of setting up a website or revamping their existing website to make it work better for them. So I've also tried and failed at lots of different things uh, to do with the web from marketing to how to design, how to write content, stuff like that. So I'm here to give you guys some sort of direct information from what I've learned over the years that you guys can apply to help not only save you time, but also save you money in uh, uh, you know, trying different things that might not necessarily work for your business. So let's just continue and what we're covering today in this, uh, this webinar is why do we have a website? How to get started? Having a goal and an objective obviously is important as well. And then furthermore, uh, using these different tools uh, that we all have available to us, um, and most of these tools are free to use. And furthermore to that, we're gonna talk about some brief SEO tips you can use, just simple, sharp, bullet points, try this, 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 and hopefully um, there's some stuff in there that you haven't already used or looked at that you can implement and benefit from. Finally, we're gonna briefly talk about a couple of tools you can use to analyze the performance of your website as well as see how people interact with it and those are quite exciting tools you'll probably know one of them already but another one i'm hoping will be a surprise for you guys so keep tuned in so having a website why do we have a website what's the big deal what you've got to remember is in today's day and age is a website's a place for people to um, find out information they need to know quickly and easily. We used to go in the phone book or we used to call a friend up and ask them or we'd go down to the grocery store to the notice board and look for information through there. Now we have our smartphones. So we can pull our smartphone out of our pocket and we can find something literally within 20, 30 seconds. So that means you need a website because what do you do when you're on your phone? You search on Google. Um, you search for something. You search for a business, a service, a product you might want. It's important that your business is online and utilizing the web. A statistic here in New Zealand shows that around 81% of people use the web as their first port of call for finding out information that they need to know. So again, instead of the yellow pages, for example, instead of the phone books, we're now using um, our telephones and the internet and obviously tablets and laptops too. Now, there's a further part to the web as such that business can utilize, apart from sort of marketing, advertising their business, they can also use uh, a website and software online to help automate certain business processes and save time. Now this uh, seminar or webinar isn't necessarily about that, but it's definitely another avenue that all businesses should look at in terms of um, finding cost effective and efficient ways to automate manual laborious tasks in their business. But let's get on to the first step. So. If you're not online, how do you get started? What's the best way to get started? So there's two ways to do it really. There's using a developer, and obviously there's doing it yourself. Now doing it yourself is generally a lot cheaper, um, but it also takes time and a lot of effort to really get the perfection sort of in there. So if you're a new business, I suggest, you, you don't, and you don't have the cash flow, then yeah, start, test the waters, set up your own website, give it a go. Um, if you are an established business, or you're looking to take it to that next level, then it is important that you do get a proper website built because you're doing a professional service for people or are selling a product, you need to make sure that you've got a, ref, a, a good business image that reflects that um, input. So there's a few things that we do with a developer, um, before you go to a web developer, should I say, that you should consider. So one is, what is your objective? And we're gonna talk about that in uh, the coming slide. Uh, what are you selling or what are you offering? Uh, what are you selling to people? If you're an electrician, why should people use you instead of the other guy down the road? Um, if you're selling products, why should people buy from your shop? Do you have free shipping? Do you offer a VIP program? Something like that. And then who is your target audience? Now, obviously our target audience is generally anyone with money, 
but in most cases it's good to have a very specific target audience of people. Are they people in your local area? Are they male or female? Are they a certain age bracket? Are they married? Are they unmarried? Um, do they have a certain hobby or interest? You've got to really define a, a, an audience that you can market to and uh, promote your website to because depending on your audience you're going to obviously cater the content, the imagery to suit that audience. And finally, what is your style? Uh, what, what's your brand? What, what are you, what's your inspiration? What are you about? Um, you've got to really get that style in place, obviously through your logo and branding, so that when you go to a developer to get your website built, you can say, look, this is what my business looks like, or this is what I'm trying to make it look like, um, and my website needs to reflect that. Now, before we lose our monitor, we'll go on to step three or um, through here, guys. So if you're not online and you're doing it yourself, so this is the other way of doing it, um, and it really incorporates the previous slide we talked about. So you've still got to really plan it, obviously, but then it's executing it. And if you're doing it yourself, you have to execute most of these things. Now, people often uh, don't know where to start. So I've made it into a simple five-step process here, number six being going live. What you want to do is first is register a domain name. Now, after that, you want to go and buy hosting and link up your content management system. So your content management system is basically a software that allows you to edit your website yourself. And this could be things like WordPress, um, it could be Joomla, it could be, for instance, our one's called Zulu. You can use CMS systems along with your hosting to help build your website and obviously going forth, uh, forth mainly is monitoring and editing and building on it. Now, if you want, if you're not necessarily technically, um, if you don't, put it this way, if you're a bit of a technophobe or you're not uh, sort of computer literate as such, then the easier way is um, doing number three here, and that is using a website builder tool. So you've probably heard of Weebly, Wix, Squarespace. Um, those tools basically incorporate hosting and the website into one package. So all you need is your domain name. Then you jump on Squarespace, you build your website, and then you pay a monthly fee and that incorporates everything in that one cost. So yeah, if you're, if you're sort of not sure, or you're a bit sort of scared of what you're gonna do or how you're gonna do it, and you just want a simple way of getting started, then I suggest using a tool such as Squarespace. Again, I've developed a tool called Zulu. If you want someone like me or my team um, to help you more hands-on, then you can use Zulu as well. But Squarespace, for example, is my recommended platform um, other than our own if you want to make a site that looks relatively good because some website building tools unfortunately aren't really built for people that don't have a good sort of design process in their head so some sites can look a bit bad hence why it's always good to use a developer if possible now after that you want to obviously get your content and pages created so what pages are you going to have on your website are you a service business if you're a service business then you should have a home page services testimonials, um, FAQs for example, and a contact page obviously. If you're a shop, you might have um, FAQs as well. You'll also have a catalog, and you might have things like um, terms and conditions and delivery policies, and maybe a latest products page or latest special sort of page as well. Once you've done that guys, I want you to show your website to your colleagues um, and your clients obviously. So yes, we can show them to our family and friends and get their feedback, but don't forget in most cases your family and your friends, like your husband or your son or your daughter or your dog, whatever, they aren't uh, your target audience. So don't take their word for what should be changed to what or what doesn't work and what does work. You should be influenced by what your clients say. So just ring up a client and say, hey, can you just check out my new website? I'd love for you to give me some feedback. And then they'll say, I don't like this or I can't find this or this is great perhaps. And then you can get all that feedback and optimize your site because you can't just go and do it yourself and expect it to be perfect from the day from day dot. And it shouldn't be either. It should be a thing that you continuously improve on um, and improve every day. Now, if you can see the little quote up in the corner there, remember, uh, building a website, it's not all about you. It's about your customer. So build your website to suit your customer or your client your target audience. Don't build it how you think it should look or how you want it to look as such. Obviously it's important it reflects what you are and what your brand is but you shouldn't be building it and thinking oh well, I'd like it like this and I'd like it like that and I want this image. Actually what does my customer want? What would my client, my ideal client be looking for um, in that? So now moving on you've got to have an objective with your website obviously. 
anything you should have an objective you know you wouldn't build a house without house plans so there's three key objectives generally that people use or that people generally have when they're making a website so it's to generate leads generate sales or to educate add credibility now if you're generating leads you're going to be giving people a lot of information about what you do how you add value over the competitors for example or what you do differently as well as including information that helps uh, convince them to make an inquiry with you and most commonly on websites it's best to use things like testimonials testimonials um, even imagery if you're a business that uh, for example builds houses um, or creates artwork then you're going to want to include a lot of imagery of artwork and houses on your website whereas if you're for example a psychologist or a lawyer then yeah, photos aren't as important. That's when you use testimonials and case studies. Now, if you're generating sales, you're generally gonna be selling either to consumers or businesses. So that's B2C and B2B. Now, if you're selling to consumers, generally your website's still gonna have some of that engaging content, uh, like why buy from us, um, why use us. Um, you're gonna give a lot of information on each product, obviously, and ideally, uh, good photos, videos, spec sheets, all that sort of information that helps uh, make them a, give them a reason to make a decision to buy. Now, products can also have, like a service business, testimonials, or more commonly known as reviews. So your products should have reviews of customers saying, look, this, is, this product's great, I love this, this, and this about it, because that helps engage people to make a decision, even if they don't know who that person is and they're on the other side of the world. Now finally, um, education and credibility is a final uh, objective that some companies have. And this is more common with charities and businesses that, or event coordinators and such, so like um, if there's a business that does a charity event or if there's a charitable trust, for example, they're fundraising, they're a news website, whatever it might be along those lines, that's when they've set up to help generate credibility and educate people. Some businesses also that work for government um, that have already a very large client base and they don't necessarily need the work or to market as such, that's when they use their website primarily just to educate and show people their professional presence and what they do and how they can help other businesses. Now, the first tool we're talking about today is Google Ads what used to be called recently Google AdWords is now Google Ads and you've probably all heard of it and you're definitely sure that every one of you would have some, uh, some way seen it somewhere at some point when they're Googling um, on the internet. So there's three types of Google Ads and the first one is search ads, then we've got display ads and then we've got remarketing ads. Now there are actually quite a few other ways of uh, using Google Ads as well, but in this instance I'm talking about the three key ones that I like to use. Now search ads is obviously you go and search for something, you look for an electrician, you'll see then ads popping up the top um, and with a headline and a description and those are generally ads and those are called Google search ads. Display ads are more indirect. If, for example, uh, you're browsing a news website or a forum, you'll generally see along the sidebars of that website or up in the header and footer, uh, little square or rectangular banner ads. And those often are used by companies to help promote what they do um, without necessarily that person looking for that service at that point in time. So if you didn't know, generally around 3% of people at any given time are looking to buy your product or service. So it's a rather small amount. Therefore, when you're doing display ads, it's important that you really have a good target audience because it's no use showing, um, for example, men's clothing um, to, to the ladies, for example, on a website um, that's not relevant to men as such. So you've got to really pick and choose when you're using display ads. Now the final one is remarketing. Remarketing sort of um, used more so once a person's already visited your website. So if I go and visit a website right now, I leave the site, I go look elsewhere, and then tomorrow, for example, I come back and I'm looking on my forum and I'm looking on for example, over in New Zealand here, Trade Me, or I'm looking at a news website, I'll start seeing ads for that company coming up on different websites over the internet. So that's called remarketing. Someone's come to your site, they've left, they haven't purchased, for example, or they haven't filled in the inquiry form, they'll start seeing your business coming up on other websites. Now, the great thing about remarketing is it's very affordable, especially in comparison to search ads where you pay per click. So remarketing allows you to build an audience 
that continuously sees your ads throughout the internet. And what you've got to remember is it takes people some time to A, make a decision, and B, it takes some repetitiveness of seeing your brand to really make them uh, make that decision. So ideally, when that person goes, I'm ready to use, or I'm ready for an electrician, or I'm ready to build my new house, you're the architect, or you're the builder, that comes up on, on that website in front of them, and they go, oh yeah, I remember looking at that guy, I'll actually get a quote from him. So that's where remarketing is very important. Now if we move on, I've got some quick tips here for search ads um, on Google. So there's a few things you've got to bear in mind when you're doing search ads. So the first one is making specific landing pages. Most people do advertising, they just set up Google ads and then they point the person when they click the ad to the homepage of their website. And that's not really good because generally when you click on an ad, it might have, for example, free shipping or new product or um, free consultation. Now when they click that ad, they want to see that offer on the landing page straight away. And if you go to a home page that's just the generic welcome to ABC Builders, um, it sort of makes them go, oh, well, where's the offer? So for example, if you're selling um, shoes, you're selling shoes, you're giving people free shipping and that's what the ad says, great range of genuine leather shoes, free shipping throughout the country, then when they click that ad, they should go straight to a landing page with that product on it or with that service on it, with that offer highlighted as well. And as well as that, you also want to include good information like why they should buy from you again or why they should use your services and then a clear call to action. Phone now, fill in this form, click here to buy now. Now, if you're a professional uh, or a sort of high cost service or an expert in your field and you charge quite a lot per hour, for example, it's important that you include your pricing in your ads because you'll often find that people are searching and they might necessarily want the most expensive option. They generally want the cheapest option. So what I like to do in my ads sometimes is actually put the price in there. I say from $2,000 or I say from $500. So that if someone's looking for a free or a cheap um, service, they're going to see my ad and then they're not going to click it. And if they don't click it, it means that I don't pay for them to click the ad, come to my site, go, oh, it's too expensive, and then leave. So put, consider putting your pricing in there if you feel like you're getting a lot of clicks and people aren't necessarily calling you. Now, creating campaigns unique to each audience. The best way I can put this is if you're a builder, again, let's go back to a builder analogy. If you build new homes, then create a campaign for new homes. If you do renovations, create a campaign for renovations. Don't create one overall campaign just saying builders, because someone's generally gonna search for renovations, new homes. And if they click on um, new homes, for example, they should go to that specific landing page. But if you make an audience to that specific uh, group of people, then you're going to get more clicks and obviously more conversions because people know exactly what they want to find as such. Now, another one that you want to look at is using negative keywords. Negative keywords best put are basically words that if they show up in someone's search, they will be excluded, um, your, 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 sorry, your ad will be excluded from Google. So for example, I do web design. If someone searches free web design or how to build my own website or web design careers or web design jobs. I don't want my ads showing to those people because they aren't actually looking for a web design service as such. They're looking for a job. So you must use negative keywords. So again, a negative keyword would be free, guide, DIY, career, even cheap. Depending on what you're trying to offer and what price point you're at, consider what keywords you should use as negative keywords. Now, there's a lot of great negative keyword lists online for free guys if you go to Google and look for them through there. And furthermore, you should use remarketing to help build an audience based on what they view. So yeah, if you do new homes, you do renovations, then it's important that you set up a remarketing audience for those specific groups. So that if someone visits your new home section, got to push the button more. <laughs> if, if someone visits the new home section on your website, then what they can do is when they go and look at, uh, you know, they're browsing the internet, like I was saying before, they're browsing a forum the next day, they will actually see ads about new homes. They won't see your renovations ads, which they don't want a renovation. They were looking at new homes, they'll see your new home ads. So if you're a retail store, 
and you have a, you know, you're a clothing store, you sell suits and you sell dresses. If someone looks at dresses, you want an audience for the people that looked at dresses because then that person will see dresses the next day. They won't see a combination of suits and dresses. They don't want suits. So make your audience, um, your remarketing audience, more targeted. Now, if you are a retailer, I strongly suggest you use what's called Google Merchant Center. If you Google Google Merchant Center, you'll find out more about it. But basically, it accounts for up to 85% of the actual purchases that are done through Google searches. So if someone goes and searches for a product, you know, a new phone, for example, the Google uh, Merchant Center ads, if you can see it on the slide here, uh, right at the top of the page, there's an image, there's a description, there's a price, and there's even reviews and free shipping uh, tags and stuff like that. It's very important that you have those set up because think about it, people, us humans are visual. We think in pictures. We don't think in words. So if we can search a phone or, a, for example, a Nike shoe, and we can see a picture of what we want there, we're gonna click on it far more likely than someone uh, than the ad that's just got the plain text description. We like to click on images. Hence why it accounts for 85% of people who buy online through those Google searches. Now they also show up right at the top of the page and they actually are more affordable in some instances than the search ads. So you're getting a prime position, a photo, your company name, and it's cheaper. So set that up guys, I really strongly suggest it. If you're, oh, another one before I move on, if you're price competitive, it can be very good as well because you're at the top of the page. There might be four companies or five companies selling that same product, but if you are price competitive, you'll generally be the first person to, uh, sorry, you'll generally be the first company that they click on because at the end of the day, it's the same product, but you're the cheapest. So, hey, people like stuff cheaper, they'll click on you first. Now, another tool that you guys should use, and I'm sure you're all familiar with, is Google My Business. Now, this is free to set up. Google My Business gives you the ability to showcase your business better on Google searches with a map, photos, and contact information. So, if you can see over in the slide here on the right-hand side, or the left-hand side for you guys, um, we've got a picture, or we've got a map, and a company name, reviews, uh, description, opening hours, phone numbers, and stuff like that. That's very important. That gives you prime real estate on Google searches, mostly for what's called local searches. So for example, we're based in Auckland City here. If I search for an Auckland um, suit shop, Auckland camera shop, Auckland laptop shop, whatever it was, if I, as that company, have a Google business page set up, then I'm far more likely to show up to that company if I didn't have, uh, to those people than if I didn't have one. And it's free. So there's no reason not to set one up. So many companies I see guys that don't have these set up and they're free to set up and they just give you much better exposure. The only thing you have to do when you set one up is verify it with a postcard. So you have to put an address in, you'll get a uh, postcard sent to you with a PIN number, and that PIN number will approve uh, your listing so that Google knows that you're sort of not lying and saying you're on the main street of the main capital city, for example. Um, but you can also hide your address. So if you do work from home, you don't have to worry about your address, I guess, being public to everybody or having random people show up at your doorstep. So if you're a plumber, for example, you don't work at home, obviously, you work out on the road everywhere. Uh, you don't have to have your address listed on there. And it can also, um, from what I understand, and what I've read, help with uh, your actual website, not only the local search ranking, obviously, but your website search ranking too, because you've got more links to your website. Now, also, Google business pages generally show up above Google ads. So like I was talking before about um, the Google ads, the Google search ads, your business will also, in some instances, show up above those search ads, and it's free. Now, Facebook. We do quite a bit of Facebook stuff nowadays, and what you've got to remember is, uh, I read oh, a couple of months ago now, but 70, up to 75% of people you like to read about or like to see what a brand's doing on Facebook to help influence their decision to buy or spend money with them. Now, this is common for products such as clothing and tech and all those sorts of things that we all love to go and buy. Um, but in general, it's important that you as a business owner has a up-to-date, um, regular sort of presence on a social media platform like Facebook. Now, there's 
so many different options. There's Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, Pinterest, Instagram, blah, blah, blah. You don't have to go and be on every single one of them. Try and think about what would my ideal client be using most likely. Am I a consumer? Okay. My, sorry, am I targeting a consumer? Yes, they're on Facebook most likely. Am I targeting a business? I'll probably use LinkedIn. Am I selling uh, clothing? Am I selling artwork? Am I selling cool things? I'll use Instagram perhaps. So Facebook's a great way to get in front of your target audience. And what you can do as well as set up your free business page on Facebook is you can actually um, do what's called boosted posts and marketing through Facebook. So you can actually target a specific group of people. You can say, I want people in this area to see my post. I want people in this uh, area of this age group, of this gender even, even of this job title or interest to see my ads. So if you're a piano shop or a music shop, you're gonna, you can put ads on Facebook that show to people that have interest in music. You could show ads that people uh, have a job title as a teacher, for example, music teachers, for example, stuff like that. So it's quite um, amazing at how you can really target down using digital media uh, platforms such as Facebook. And you can actually also do this with Google, but I'm not talking about it in this uh, webinar. Now, LinkedIn, as I just said before, LinkedIn's more of the uh, business professional version of Facebook, you could say. LinkedIn also has very similar marketing features as Facebook. So again, you can post, you can promote your business to people on LinkedIn. Um, and you can also target them, obviously, like you can on Facebook and Google. But with uh, LinkedIn, you can also target more specifically, again, job titles, but even industries, age groups, um, qualifications and experience. It's got, again, quite a lot of good uh, tools you can use to drill down that audience and get it more specifically. Now, another cool feature of LinkedIn, if you're a service business and you're maybe professional, like a lawyer, for example, um, or you can help a lot of businesses, then what I like to do sometimes is there's a marketing feature called InMail, if I'm correct, and you can actually put ads in people's inboxes, their private messaging inboxes on LinkedIn that sort of says, you know, hey John, I'm a, I'm a professional web developer and I want to help market your business. If your current web developer is not giving you the best service, or you feel like you're paying too much or whatever it might be, please uh, give me a bell and I'll be happy to come and have a chat with you at some point. That's, that's quite cool, different ways of sort of marketing your business rather than just the plain old ads. So LinkedIn has a lot of great features in it. And again, post to it regularly. Add your business page on there. Used to be really only built for individuals as such, but now companies can list their businesses on there, post updates, and um, obviously market themselves too. So I've got a few quick fire tips here, guys, for content and layout. So obviously there's lots of tools we can go through, but in this uh, webinar, I'm just gonna really briefly go through a few tips here for doing content on your website. Now, first one's keeping it to the point. Most people get caught up in waffling on, making novels of content for their web pages um, that people just simply aren't gonna read for you. Now, if you're in a business where it's people's uh, hobbies or passions for something, then yeah, people do like to read a bit more. But if someone needs a plumber, they need an electrician, uh, they need to find a local clothing store, for example, they aren't really wanting to read through paragraphs, they don't have time to read through paragraphs of content. So it's important that you keep it to the point. Headline, brief intro, some bullet points, a few buttons, where you go. Convey the value and the end result to the customer as well. Don't talk, again, don't talk about you. Don't make it all about you or your business as such. Don't say, you know, we're a professional, we've got 20 years experience, blah, blah, blah. Say it, but also, but also, but, but more so, sorry, talk about how you can actually benefit the client or the customer. You know, are you having this issue? Are you sick of this, this, and this? Uh, is your you know your staff not performing well, or is your you know is your profits low? Blah blah blah. This is how we can help you. This is what we can do to add value to your business, because that's what people at the end of the day want. They want to know how can you help me. I don't care about you know. Yeah, hey, sure, you got 20 years experience, cool, but how can you help me? Now, when it comes to uh, writing content, it's important that you have a good balance of content. Because as I said, people don't like to read through paragraphs and paragraphs or novels of content. But then Google, SEO-wise, search engine optimization-wise, 
Google likes to see a lot of content on your website. So generally what I recommend is write four to 600 words on each web page. Now that's a lot of text and on a page I can, you can imagine it looks like a big, looks like a book. That's not gonna work. So moving on to my next point is structure it like a pyramid, which is the 80-20 rule. Now the top of the page, there's not a lot up there. It's relatively, you know, it's relatively, uh, uh, how do you say, it's sparse. You know, I've got a headline, got a few bullet points, got some buttons, called action, got a, uh, an image. That's about it. If people want more, they'll scroll down. They'll look around for more. But people in a rush, they don't want to look around. If it's too much, they'll leave. You've only got a few seconds to capture them. Make sure those headlines engage them. So 80-20 rule, 80% 80 of people like the short and sweet, 20% like to read more. Again, it varies depending on what it is. Again, if it's a passion, I love cars, I'll go to a car website, I will read quite a bit. But if I want an electrician, I just go to the website, where's the phone number? Oh yeah, he's a qualified electrician, that's all I need to know. So just, just think about how you're gonna structure your content. And again, don't be afraid to make it scroll. Start at the top, nice and simple, add detail below. If people want it, they'll look for it. Make sure every page has a call to action. Put your phone number on there, um, put a button on there, get in contact with us get a quote, free consultation, a free book or free webinar, whatever it might be. People on their phones, obviously guys, you've got to remember, they are in a rush generally most of the time. So make sure your phone number is always visible on your website. Make a little icon even, click it, ring, away you go. People don't want to have to go and scroll to the bottom trying to find the phone number, so make sure it's simple. Now use a variety of key phrases to slash keywords in your content and headline. When I say a variety, I mean mix it up. Don't, as we, say, as we call it, sort of um, keyword, uh, cr crush all the keywords into a paragraph of content. Make sure it reads well. We don't want people, uh, well, sorry, you don't want to get penalized by Google. You know, people say to me, oh, do I just go and write this keyword 100 times on the page and I'll come up first? Maybe in the early 90s, mid 90s, sure, um, but not really anymore. Actually, Google was the late 90s, I think. <laughs> anyway, so it's important that you use a good variety of content, but make sure it's written well. So use a copywriter if you can. If you're not confident writing copy, summarize what you want to communicate on that page and then get a professional copywriter to help you do it. If you're using a web developer, it's most likely or should be um, really included in your quote or your setup so you don't have to worry about how to write the best content. Now, breaking up the content with white space and imagery is very important. A lot of sites try and fit everything up the top of the page, but what we don't forget is people scroll, especially on phones. So you don't have to cram everything up on the top of the page. Space it out, just like I was referring to before about the pyramid, of, the pyramid structure of content. Give everything a lot of breathing room, nice big heading, uh, bullet points, give them lots of breathing room. Don't jam everything up together because it's just not easy. It doesn't flow nicely for the, for the user. Now, if we're comparing quickly some good and bad uh, website designs, and we're getting close to the end now, guys, but if we take a look at this example here, this is a website that I've picked up um, overseas, just to show you. Now, if we look here, it's just a big blob of everything. I might get you started to get a close up on this for the viewers so they can see that. Um, but look here, we've got a heading at the top here, a very long heading. We've got, uh, it looks like keyword cramming up the top here as well. And then we've got three big, um, big paragraphs of text. We've got a few images. Hey, those images, yeah, not too bad. It shows the end result, which is good. A big picture of someone welding. If you're a welding company, people generally aren't interested in you actually welding. They wanna see the end result. So this guy should really have a picture of his nicely done or nicely fabricated gates as the main photo. If you're a building company again, make sure that you actually have um, pictures of the finished houses rather than a house fully gutted with its walls stripped because people aren't interested. They wanna see, oh, I love the look of that. I'd love my house to look like that. And down the side here, we've also got navigation. Now this is quite an old school way of doing it. Since our websites are generally now built to be responsive, it's important that the actual navigation of the site goes along the top, especially because pretty much, oh, at a guess, 90% plus websites have the navigation on the top. People are used to it. If they land on a page and go, oh, where's the navigation? and they don't have time to search, oh, there it is there. 
um, then people are going to leave more likely. So don't try and deviate as well too much from uh, what it should be uh, set up to be. Now, that's an example of a messy site. Now, if we go to a site that, for example, I built, now this site actually is about three years old. I built this a while ago, but it's a good example of um, simplicity and clear direction of where the user can go. Okay, I've got the company brand here. I've got my main menu. I've got my phone number. You guys probably can't see the detail, sorry, but hopefully you can sort of get what I'm going at. And then we've got our five key services. Phone, admin, accounts, payroll, office. Okay, I want payroll. I click on payroll. I don't have to scroll. Not that scrolling hurts, but I don't have to scroll. It's right there. I can click on it away I go. And again, phone number's there. So if I'm on my phone, the phone number, I can tap on it and call straight away. I've got one more, I think, for you guys. Yeah, this website here, this one's a relatively new one I built a while ago, back at the start of this year. Um, this one has what's commonly called a slider at the top of the page, and that rotates through with different services that are offered, perhaps. Um, and I've got a clear headline, workplace protection. I've got a nice menu bar. I've got a big phone number, I've got the company's brand, and I've got a nice little feature image of the projects they work on, and I've got a nice intro paragraph. Um, and further below that, there's the key little service buttons like we just saw on the uh, business website from before. You'll also see that the website design matches the brand's logo. The logo's black and orange, the template's black and orange, the fonts match, it's all nice and crisp and tidy. Don't go and use random fonts and random colors because it doesn't look good. This site, for example, doesn't even have a logo, but look at all the colors, lime green, uh, red, blue, pink. It's just a little too much. So just keep it simple, don't overthink it. So some final SEO tips for you guys to utilize. If you don't know what SEO means, by the way, it's search engine optimization. You've probably heard me say it a few times throughout this, obviously. Um, and there's two types of SEO. There's on-page and off-page. Now, off-page is setting up a Facebook page, setting up a Google My Business page. Um, it might be listing your business on a search directory, for example. Now, if you're doing on-page SEO, that's when you're creating content. You're adding content to your website, you're adding blog posts, um, you're adding um, all the information to it, photos, alt tags, um, you're maybe adding schema markups, so coding, um, adding meta tags. There's lots of things you can do to optimize your website, obviously, for SEO on the page. Just depending on your skill level, obviously, as to what you can do, there's a lot of stuff you can do in the code behind the scenes, so to speak. And there's a lot of stuff you can do just in, in the sense of writing good content, good copy. It's trying to find a balance really between um, good copy that the customer will engage with, but also good copy that still helps your website come up in searches. A little quick tip is, for example, on a lot of websites, they say, welcome to my business. That's the main headline. Welcome to my business. Welcome to ABC Builders. Don't do that. Make your main headline actually an engaging uh, key phrase sort of introduction professional building company in Auckland. And then below that, welcome to ABC Builders, for example. Make sure your site has an XML sitemap and also a robots.txt file. Now you'll probably say, what the heck is that? <laughs> that's, um, that's fine. If you're using a software like Squarespace, it'll probably already have that set up in it. But if you're using a web developer, just simply say, hey, this guy was, he said, hey, this guy was talking about a um, XML sitemap or whatever that is they will understand hopefully and they can set that up for you. So it's very important that you set these things up um, on your website. Now make sure your page titles include key phrases. So that's basically just going back to what I was sort of talking about before. Make sure your pages are informative, the headlines are informative and they engage the user. So again, don't say welcome to or don't say homepage or don't say even services. Say building services Auckland or massage services or a massage price list, or, um, or it might be cafe menu, or Auckland cafe menu. Depends, obviously we don't want to sound too sort of uh, tinny or like doesn't make sense, but it still needs to be written in a way that is engaging for SEO, so that Google can really pick up those keywords and utilize them to their best potential. Now, make sure all your images have an alt tag. So an alt tag is basically a text description or a caption you could say for a photo. And that's goes, that goes on the actual website in the code. You never actually see the alt tag, but it's, it's what Google reads. It's what Google uses to distinguish what an image is. So rather than Google saying, oh, okay, I, I can't see what that image, because they can't see, I can't see what that image is, you give them an alt tag and it says, picture of baby. They go, oh, okay, well, it's a picture of a baby. 
and that helps for people as well that are hard of hearing or are blind, for example, um, that can be used with the accessibility software they use, excuse me, to browse the web. So an alt tag is basically a description of what the image is. This picture, a picture of a baby sitting on a picnic, uh, picnic mat in a field. If you've got a picture of a car, if you've got a picture of a new house, picture of five bedroom house in Auckland. If you've got a car, picture of Mercedes-Benz C-Class for sale in Auckland. Use those keywords where possible. Now, another one we have here, guys, is using page speed. If you Google Google page speed, you'll see there's a tool where you can put your website in and it basically identifies on it, um, so to speak, a score out of 100 for your mobile website and your desktop website. Now, if your website's not mobile, make sure you get it mobile. But basically, with those scores, you can see what needs to be improved. Is your, are your images too big? Are you using up too much? Is your page taking too long to load or is it too slow, for example? Google gives you these insights, and if you execute what they say is wrong and you fix it, then you'll find your site will rank better. So go and check that out. Another little tip, if you do use the tool, there's a feature where you can download everything from Google. They basically optimize all the images on your site and give you to them, ready to upload. So you don't have to worry about trying to fiddle around in Photoshop or doing it yourself. You can actually download them and re-upload them straight away yourself. That's great. Now, uh, meta titles. This is the final, tar final, tar final part. <laughs> the meta title is basically the, um, the, the, the headline that comes up on a Google search result. And it's also the actual title that comes up in the window, the top window of your browser. So it's important that, especially on Google, your meta title is informative. So we'll say, instead of just saying ABC Builders, we'll say professional building company in Auckland, then hyphen ABC Builders. Now keep this title to around 60 characters max. If it's too long, it'll get chopped off. If it's too short, then you're not utilizing the best SEO capability that you have. Now the description is simply the smaller text that comes below it. And in the description, again, you can go into a slight bit more detail. 20 years experience helping you build your dream home for less and without the hassles, for example. So again, you can include keywords in there, but also include the customer's uh, wants or pain points as well. Another little trick that you guys can use just to make your uh, result on Google, your little text display ad, uh, not ad, but result coming up on Google, for every word in your description and your title, use the first, or make the first letter uppercase. So, for example, professional building company Auckland, instead of professional being the only uppercase uh, word, make them all uppercase. It just makes it stand out a little bit more. And you can do that as well with your Google Ads, as you'll see if you, um, if you research it. If you go and look at ads on Google, you'll probably find they all have uppercase first letters of each word. It just makes them pop out that little bit more. Now, moving on, the final part we're talking about today is continuously improving and analyzing your website. So it's vital that you track how people use your website. And there's two tools I love to use that are both free. Uh, one of them has a paid plan, but they're both free to get going. Is Hotjar and Google Analytics. And you've probably heard of Google Analytics. You possibly haven't heard of Hotjar. If you have, then well done. Um, but if we go straight on to Google Analytics, Google Analytics basically allows you to track um, the interaction with your website. So what are people looking at? What are they doing? How much time are they spending on your website? And all that sort of information. What you can do is you can use the information to see what's popular and what's working. Okay, people are looking at this specific product. They're looking at this service mostly. So hey, I might make that service my main service on my homepage. I might make that service pop out more than others. Now you might have a service, for example, that doesn't get a lot of attention, or it's got a high bounce rate. Bounce rate meaning someone visits the page off Google, and they leave straight away, they don't get what they want. Now, if you've got a page with a high bounce rate, then you can say, okay, well this page isn't informative enough, or it doesn't have the right information, or maybe my product's too expensive, and then you can sort of adjust depending on those, those statistics. So Google Analytics basically just gives you a table of information. This is how many people, this is how long they spend on the page, you can even see where they're from and how they're finding you. Google, Facebook, um, direct referrals from other websites. So it can be quite good to use um, and improve on. Now what I also like to do is compare how people use my mobile website and my desktop website. So my website, for example, my own website, gets around 30% traffic on mobile and 70% traffic on desktop. If you're dealing with a lot of businesses, business people still sit on a computer. 
if you're dealing with consumers, they're riding home on the train, they're driving, well, hopefully not driving and texting, but you know they're on their phone. They're looking up information all the time. So if you've got a, if you're dealing with customers, you're probably going to get more people on their mobile. Whereas me dealing with businesses, I get a lot more people still on desktop. But what you need to do is look at on my mobile phone or on my mobile website, are people staying for long? Are they leaving quickly? If they're leaving quickly, then you need to go, okay, well, actually, maybe the site's too hard to use, or maybe it's got the wrong information on there. But you've also got to remember, people still on a mobile website generally will give you a call quickly. They don't really have the time to sit there and analyze everything. So regardless, it's generally always going to have a higher bounce rate and a lower session time, less people spending less time on it. Now, if we move on to Hotjar, Hotjar, again, is free. It's a free tool to use up to a certain extent. Now, what's cool about Hotjar is you can use heat maps. So you can put a bit of code on your website and basically it'll show you using uh, red and blue dots what people are clicking on the most. Are they clicking on the top of the page in the header? Are they clicking down the bottom of the page? What are they actually clicking on? And what you can do is you can analyze and go, okay, well, they're clicking on this stuff, so that's great. Um, or maybe oh, the, at the bottom of the page, they're clicking on this link. Now, that's when you can go to yourself, okay, everyone's clicking on this link at the bottom of the page. Maybe I'll move it up the page. Again, using the builder analogy, guys, you're probably sick of it, but if you're a building company and you've got new homes, renovations, and at the bottom, you've got additions. Let's say everyone's clicking on additions. Then in your heat map, you can say, oh, everyone's clicking down the bottom there on additions. Move that to the top of the page. Promote that more, make that more obvious to people. So you can sit down, you can analyze. Now let that let that information build up. Don't just you know don't just consider oh yeah one person looked at it I'll go have a look. Wait till it builds up so you can see overall what everyone's doing on your website. Now the next tool I have which I love is recordings and it sounds a little bit creepy, but people can actually uh, using Hotjar you can actually see people using your website, and I I don't mean people actually seeing them through their webcam or anything uh, sort of scary or creepy like that, but actually seeing people using your website on their screen, their point of view from their screen. So you can see their mouse moving and clicking on different parts of the website. That's a great tool to use, especially after you build up a good bank of recordings, because you can actually then go, okay, um, I'll sit down with a bottle of wine or a beer or whatever for an hour, and I'll go through my recordings. And what you can do is starting to see patterns. So people have patterns. You'll see people You'll see their mouse, their cursor, scrolling around, trying to find, and they can't find it. And then they do find it, they click on it. And you'll see a pattern, and you'll see lots of people doing that. So you can go, okay, is this button too small? Is it not obvious? Do I need to move it up the page? Do I need to make it bigger? Do I need to make it flash? What do I need to do um, to help improve that um, interaction with my website? That's something Google Analytics doesn't really give you. That's why you should use Hotjar as well, because it really allows you to analyze uh, both sides of the spectrum. So you can sit down and you can see people scrolling around looking for things. That way you can really make um, improvements to your website that are going to help convert more people into buying or selling from you. And finally, keep working at it. Every website needs to be kept, you know, you need to keep maintaining it. People set up websites and they leave them. They go, okay, well, you know, that'll do it. I'll just let it do its thing. No, you can't do that. You've got to keep updating it. Whether you use your developer or if you're sort of price conscious, just keep doing it yourself. Just keep adding content to it and keep changing content around. Even if you just do a blog post once a week, once a month, or even if you do things like chuck some, you know, on my website, I chuck Christmas tinsel when it's Christmas time or I chuck an Easter egg on there. Just keep it sort of fresh, keep it updated. If it's summertime, get rid of your winter sales promotion banners. I see a lot of sites with uh, winter deals on them when it's summertime. Just keep on top of it. Just keep it fresh. Now, what I'd like you guys to do also is consider uh, sitting down every week, obviously, writing out some piece of content that you can promote on your page. So it might not necessarily be a special or an offer or a deal. It might actually be something more important like, um, you know, if you're a dry cleaning company, for example, you could be promoting things like how to get stains out of shirts easily or uh, five methods to... Um, to getting a nicely ironed shirt, adding value to people, not just selling the whole time. 
Because if you look like the expert, or you portray yourself as the expert in your field, and you offer valuable free advice, people are gonna look at you as the expert, and they'll say, oh yeah, I'll use him because he knows what he's talking about. Or he or she, sorry. He knows he or she knows what he's talking about. But don't get caught up in just selling all the time. A lot of companies make that mistake. Buy, buy, buy from me, buy from me, buy from me. No, no, I'm not doing it for free, buy from me. Don't do that. Stand out and be the leader in your field and offer free, valuable advice. People say, oh, but then what if they, you know, I give them free ideas or if I do this webinar, for example, you won't use me for web design. I don't care. I'm offering you valuable information and whether that helps me or not in the future, that's fine. So thanks for joining me on this webinar. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you found something valuable from it. Even if it's just one thing, implement it and try it. Because people, you know, they, and I was actually a bit of a bit guilty for this, they watch these webinars, they read books, and they don't put anything into action. Put it into action and see how it goes. And then I want you to let me know how you, uh, how you get on. So if you'd like to find out more about me, or like to get more information to me, or have a chat to me, go to my website, www.mattread.co.nz. That's M A T T R E I D.co.nz. If you'd like a copy of my new book, Unraveling the Web, please go to my website, order a copy, or just get in touch with me, and I'll be happy to help.